Kathleen, um, and I'm delighted to be here today to share a bit of my story and also hope to inspire a bit of story sharing amongst yourselves. So um, I first of all just like everyone to check an item of clothing that you have and look at the label and tell me, shout out some names of where your clothing's from. So if you could just check any labels on clothing you've got and shout out some sources. Everyone's got clothes on. I'm not asking you to strip, so don't worry. I just want <laughs> some suggestions of labels you've got. <clears throat> uh, where has it come from? Yeah, China. Cool. Italy. England. Cool. That's good. Um, Scotland. Okay. Cool. Um, well, second point is: um, Has anyone met the people who've made their clothes? No. Okay, cool. Well, um, my change-making journey began six years ago in Bangladesh, which produces um, about 40% of the world's clothing. Um, and I went there after university um, because I was interested in well-being in different countries. So I spent um, a year volunteering half of it in the UK, in Scotland, in the, at the very top of Scotland, and half of it in Bangladesh. Uh, which is the most densely populated country in the world, about 1,000 people per square kilometre, which is, is quite an intense place to live. Um, and I spent my time there working with a charity which supported slum children um, into education. Um, and I had one experience there that really impacted the rest of my life. Um, and it was interviewing 11-year-old girls who had left primary school to see what they'd gone on to do after primary school. Um, and I interviewed a mix of them, and half of them worked in clothes factories in Bangladesh. You might have heard of clothes factories recently um, in the news. There was a big um, disaster at clothes factory um, in Bangladesh uh, with a lot of the floors collapsing. Um, and the conversations I had with these young kids um, just really impacted me in terms of my perception of how the economy is structured and where stuff comes from. Um, the, the girls I were interviewing um, were 11 years old and they worked 12 hour days, 7 days a week um, and just really, basically didn't really have much of a life. Um, so I came back to the UK after that and I was just constantly checking <laughs> the origin of things from not just clothes but food, everything and I really just felt for a year very confused and angry and sad about like things I consumed and um, just really kind of frustrated by how the whole world was structured. Um, and during that time, I was working in mental health um, in London, in East London. Um, I was working with people who had um, different sorts of mental health problems. And one of the things I observed with them as well was how um, the current kind of consumption patterns we have um, do not help people feel well here. So a lot of people you know, eat food that they feel that they don't even know how to make it, it's bad for them. Um, they buy expensive clothes because they feel pressurised to wear certain labels. And I just I became very interested in changing the relationship between producers and consumers. So um, throughout that year when I was working, I kind of went to lots of talks, events, um, just kind of looking at the different ways of doing things in society. Um, and I, I became interested in the transition movement, um, which is a movement of people trying to create an alternative economy across the world. Um, and they had a, a global gathering in the UK that year in the summer. So I went to it. I took four days off work and went to it. Um, and I met some really inspiring people there. And as a result of that, I came back to London and decided to quit my job and just do something different. I thought, I, I, at the moment, I don't have the headspace to think when I'm doing my current work about creating something else. So I'm just going to force myself to create that time and energy to do something different. So it was really scary. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I felt I was a year out of university. Most of my friends were on like graduate jobs, or like on some quite like specific career path. Um, and it was a bit of a dive into the darkness. Um, and I spent the first year of that time um, experimenting with lots of different sorts of things. Um, so I got involved with like political act activist groups. Um, I like occupied um, RBS headquarters in, in Scotland um, with a group of people I didn't barely even knew. Um, um, but I became, through that network, very interested in the impact that a small group of people can have on the media and the stories that we share. And 
And so I got involved with UK Uncut at the very beginning of days. So it's like an anti-cut group, um, which is still active. It has 100,000 followers on Twitter and Facebook, which is more than the major national political parties these days, <laughs> which is pretty good. Um, and throughout that year, I was just experimenting with ways of like challenging the current economic paradigm and how we think about um, the current economic system. So. Um, one of the things I was really interested in was like producers within the system, so people who make our food, make our clothes, they're so, so invisible to us in the way we live in the UK and in many developed countries. So um, I began to, I started to visit farms, um, I became interested in food production in the UK and as, as a result of that I uh, decided to start growing food myself with the local people in my area and I came across a piece of land that and wasn't being used and it was owned by a community centre which also had a house and I basically bartered for them in exchange for rent. So I said I will do something with this piece of land in the local community um, if I can live in exchange for like reduced rent because I don't have money to sustain myself right now. So um, I set up a community in Elephant and Castle um, five years ago, a community garden and it's still going today. It's in its third hands now of coordinator. Um, it's about 500 people who visited it. Um, across those years and there's a regular weekly group made up of local people in the area who grow carrots, potatoes, lots of different sorts of things and through that experience of just taking a really small action in my own life um, and doing something I didn't feel comfortable doing, I didn't, had never grown any food before and um, when I started the community garden I thought it was going to be a shambles and that like nothing would grow, it would just be a desert and I was really embarrassed about when the summer came and people came to look at it that there would be no food, but that wasn't the case. Almost everything we tried grew from even experimental things like tomatillos, which is like Mexican version of tomatoes, um, to purple potatoes. Um, so I, doing that small local project gave me a lot of confidence in doing something without knowing what the outcome was going to be. Um, and that has had a massive impact in how I've been working for the last three or four years now. So in March last year, um, I came in contact with a social enterprise called the Food Assembly, um, which started in France three years ago. Um, and basically, the Food Assembly is all about bringing power back to producers and enabling people to access local food in their area. So it's basically like a prepaid farmer's market. So local farmers and food makers put their products online through on a website. And then um, a local person organises a weekly pop-up market and the farmers and food makers come to the week up, weekly market and hand out the food um, that has been ordered on online, online. And this market system is working really well in France. There's now over 700 assemblies across France working with half a million customers um, and over 4,000 farmers and food makers across France. Um, and I thought this idea was just amazing. I thought this is really using like internet technology for the best means. Uh, we are making something more efficient, but also using internet technology to connect people offline as well. Um, so I started talking with the founders in France, um, and then in April this last year, um, I started to set up the network in the UK. Um, and now, eight months on, there's 11 assemblies now across the UK, so um, from Cornwall to Lancaster and seven in London. Um, and I've now got a team of five people working with me, um, and we're in contact with over 70 farmers and food makers, and we're aiming to have uh, at least 70 markets across the UK um, by the end of this year. Um, and the, one of the beautiful things about this m social enterprise model is it's very holistic, so it's really in reinventing what business is. So it works on a kind of on an economic, environmental, and social level. So um, with a lot of current companies, very economic driven, so very profit orientated. Um, but with the current model that I'm working in, um, we think of those three key elements. So on an economic level, um, each food assembly um, supports local producers to get a fair price for their products. So every item that's sold on the food assembly platform, um, the producers get 83% of that, and that's a fixed rate that hasn't changed for three years. Um, the remaining 17% gets split between half between a local person who organises that micro enterprise and the food assembly which provides the web platform. Um, and so um, there's now over 700 assemblies and they are all managed by local people. So over 700 jobs have been created over three years. Um, and 80% of these people are women um, that um, need 
like flexible work and it's like a 10 to 15 hours a week um, and it also is really supporting women to get a taste of enterprise and what it's like to set up your own business so on an economic level it's very great because both good for the producers and for the local economy um, it's also supporting local people to access food at a price that's more accessible um, than through other conventional means um, on the environmental level um, all the food within the food assemblies are sourced within 100 miles of each market um, so the average mileage per product is 28 miles, and that compares to um, the average mileage per food served in a supermarket, which is about 2,000 miles. So it's like vastly different um, in terms of the amount of energy, unsustainable energy, gone into food production. Um, it also means that because the farmers know exactly how much they've sold in advance before they come to the assemblies, because they've it's been ordered online. They, there's no waste um, in the distribution of the food, so a lot of farmers would go to farmers markets and not know how much they're going to sell, but with the food assembly they know exactly in advance. Um, and then on a social level, which is probably the level that I'm most interested in, um, in this social enterprise, it, um, the, one of the key things about the food assembly is about bringing both producers and consumers together um, so that people have an understanding of the people people's work that's gone into producing this food and also to re-socialise the shopping experience. So um, a lot of supermarkets these days, which is the mainstream where people buy food, um, you know, have self-service checkouts, it's very easy to go into a shop and not even have a conversation with anyone, never mind the people who've made the food. Um, whereas with the food assembly, when the producers come to hand out their food, and this could be bread, cheese, fruit, vegetables, wine, gin, anything that's sourced within that. <laughs> Yes, alcohol is important too. Um, uh, people can actually have a conversation with the people who've made their food. And that really has a big impact on your understanding and taste of what the food's like. So, for example, this pear I got through the food assembly um, in Stoke Newington. Um, and I know the farmer, he's a Dutch man called Stein, who um, has set up like, quite an interesting farm in Sussex. And he has got two farms in one. So he's got um, 3,000 chickens that roam free around an orchard um, and all the, the idea is like a cyclical system so um, the chickens um, eat some of the fruit that's fallen on the ground that helps their diet and then they also um, their manure kind of helps fertilize the soil and helps promote like better fruit tree growth um, and so when I eat this pear I have like a story attached to it in a way that I wouldn't have if I'd bought something kind of anonymously um, so I I think in terms of the learning curve I've had over the last five years, the significant things for me in terms of how I work are being confident in what you feel you want to change. Um, so I felt very clear that I was unhappy and just felt very angry about how the current economic paradigm is very corrupt and there's a lot of like... Um, it's not really, it's not benefiting either consumers or producers, it's just benefiting big corporations. So I felt very clear it was something I wanted to work on and I felt connected on that on an emotional level. And then something I've really learned in the last few years is the importance of having confidence in not knowing how you're going to tackle it, but just feeling like the first thing to do is just take one step at a time. Um, and that is something that I, I'm, this is something I do now in my daily life as a social entrepreneur. This is a key skill to have um, because we live in a very dynamic world where things are very complex and things can change from one day to the next. So I don't, I've forgotten about having master plans and very fixed ideas of where things should be in six months, 12 months time. It's, it's good to have that, but the more important thing is to have, be clear about what your values are and work with them to implement change on a daily basis. Stop it.